soft-spoken, humble, and never without a smile. He is the shepherd of the flock for the Diocese of Kuala Lumpur. On the 20th of April 2020, it will be 18 years since his priestly ordination at the Church of the Visitation in his hometown, Seremban. In this episode, Catholics at Home is honoured to speak with the Most Reverend Archbishop Julian Liao. Hello and welcome to another episode of Catholic Set Home, which is produced in collaboration with the Catholic Research Centre in Kuala Lumpur. My name is Kachang Kevin and my co-host today is Mark Darren Lee. Hey Mark, how are you doing? Hi, hi, hi Archbishop. Hi Kevin. I'm doing good. Hey, hey Mark, you know, whenever we have a guest on the show, we always like to ask them uh, whether they are football fans and what team we support. Do you reckon Archbishop supports any team? Uh, do you think? I think so. You think so? You think so? Think okay, so. we'll get to some football questions a little later and see see about that. But now, before we begin the conversation with our very special guest, uh, Archbishop Julian Liao, let me. I just want to manage expectations a little bit because the viewers watching, uh, I'm telling you, some of them have my phone number and they'll start messaging me and they're telling me why you didn't ask Bishop this, why you didn't ask Bishop that. So let me just manage expectations a little bit. All right. This show is going to be about the life story of Archbishop Julian Liao. We want to know the person of Julian Liao, all right? So we, we're not going to talk about any church policy or church issues, but if it comes up, then, you know, why not? Lah? But I just want to manage some expectations with our viewers here, all right? Now, okay. Uh, all right, so let's get straight into it. Your Grace, thank you for being on the show. How have you been coping with the MCO? Still alive. <laughs> Amen to that. Uh, Archbishop, apart from um, uh, work or you know uh, mass and prayers and all that, uh, what do you miss most that you could not do under the MCO? What do you miss the most? I think it's obvious to be jogging outside, out of my ah. compound. Uh, ah. First thing I miss uh, doing that. Uh, although I hope uh, it's not going into the wrong hands, but I try to jog within my compound if that is allowed. <laughs> <That's the problem. laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want about... to fatten the curve. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I live alone, so I don't think it's uh, breaking any laws, but uh, yeah. never knows. Yeah. I'm still being a bit careful. Yeah. How about food, Archbishop? I mean, uh, do you miss? I mean, who cooks for you at, at, at uh, today? Fortunately, I have a housekeeper and uh, Lucia. She she cooks my meals. Uh, although I'm telling her to try to cut down on the quantity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Arch Archbishop. Uh, talking about food, uh, I notice your sermons. Uh, some whenever it comes up about diversity, uh, you like to use this analogy about the nasi lemak. I mean. What is it with the nasi lemak? You really love nasi lemak? Where's the best nasi lemak you, you usually get from? It's not that I love nasi lemak, but uh, I think nasi lemak has a very good analogy to, to us as Malaysians. I'm not sure whether I've spoken before, but uh, to repeat, um, the white rice, mm -hmm. as we all know, uh, coupled with the sambal, which mm -hmm. is red, Huh? Uh, the timun, which is greenish, whitish, mm -hmm. yourself, the kacang, which is <laughs> brown. <laughs> uh, what else do they put? The egg. Egg, yeah, egg. Mm. So, all this, uh, the ikan bilis, of course, with the sambal. You know? yeah. uh, all this make up nasi lemak. If you have one less ingredient, mm. uh, it won't taste. Mm. Of course, the mm. salt, the spices, and all these things. So mm. I think it's an analogy to describe Malaysia. Mm. Uh, the, 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 if I'm not mistaken, that's the national food, I think. Uh, some may not agree, but <laughs> it is one of the national foods of Malaysia. So with the colors, with the, the taste, with the different uh, varieties, I think it best describes us. And it will taste perfect when everyone when all those ingredients are there and uh, malaysia is only malaysia when 
all of us are part of it. Yeah, fantastic. Just, just want to know, spicy or less spicy for you personally? Uh, not too spicy. <laughs> uh, moderately spicy, yes. <laughs> all right. And uh, Mark wants to know something about football. <laughs> Yeah, Archbishop. I mean, do you do you follow the English the English Premier League? Well, they're not playing live these days, so I do look at the some of the repeats or the nineteen, oh sorry, twenty fourteen, twenty eighteen kinds of ah. things. Uh, I don't play football much myself, but uh, I know people who are crazy, and uh, Liverpool fans seem to be. Uh, what do you call it? Annoying. The flavor of the day, I guess. Hopeful. <laughs> no, we said everything, I think. Liverpool will, 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 will not get whatever they hope to get. I, I, I understand. <laughs> so, Archbishop, are you a Manchester United fan? I think uh, I think a lot of people want to know that. <laughs> I am, uh, what's the word? I have to be, to be fair in a sense. Uh, no, I don't, I'm not, Particular with any club, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, Archbishop, it's coming up to eighteen years uh, being a priest. Uh, you're ordained a bishop almost six years ago. How would you describe the journey? Uh, the priesthood or the the the, the bishop episcopal uh, maybe, journey? Uh, yeah, maybe you can start with oh. the priesthood. Well, priesthood, 18 years, huh? I have to be reminded of <laughs> time uh, Well, uh, it has been a very interesting journey for me so far, thus far. Uh, the priesthood, I think, from 2002 to 2014, 12 years mm. as a priest, and then I think six years now as a bishop. Uh, Definitely, as, as a priest, uh, I had different roles, different places that I was put in or sent to. Um, starting off in my own hometown, I was ordained in Suramban uh, and put there as assistant. And then in a couple of years or so, uh, I became a parish priest in Kajang. Uh, and then after two, three years, that was, again, it's a toss between your first love, uh, Shramban and Kajang. It's always uh, a toss. Uh, in Kajang, I was parish priest. So in a sense, first love as, as parish priest. Uh, mm -hmm. Shramban was the assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, so these were the honeymoon years, I would, I would put it. Uh, and I learned a lot from my uh, so-called senior, senior priests, uh, Father Philip So, uh, Father Ben Sariamutu, uh, both have deceased now. Um, and of course, Father Albert was parish priest in Shramban and I was there with him. And yeah, those were, were great times. And then I was sent to study to further my studies in, 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 in Rome, uh, coming back after three, four years, and then sent to the seminary. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a different role there in the seminary as a formator. Uh, and then we got the bad news that I was to be bishop. Uh, <laughs> 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 again, uh, I changed again my, my, my life. Uh, from 6,000 odd parishioners to 20 seminarians and now to 150,000 parishioners and uh, 66 uh, overgrown sons as priests. <laughs> yeah. So the role has changed, and uh, but I'm loving every moment of it. You, you know, in, in a few of your interviews, earlier interviews years ago, when you were after you became uh, Archbishop, um, you said something that uh, to the effect that you were still wondering why you were placed in this position. Uh, so today, has this become a bit more clearer to you? 
I think it's become a bit more blurred. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, you'll never know exactly why one is put in this role. Uh, yeah, it's. I wouldn't say it's beginning to be clearer, but uh, every day is a challenge. Every day it's a new day. It's a new adventure, and uh, even though it's locked in at home, who would imagine we'll be doing this and uh, reaching? thousands uh, of people yeah. you know, which are so every situation we are in i guess we we can discover a purpose there and i've always have had this attitude uh, of seeing the best in every situation and i guess that has uh, has brought me where i am and uh, has given me at least a, a perspective on 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 life, especially when things are not so clear uh, these days, what will the church look like tomorrow? Uh, but I believe whatever it is, they're not alone. Uh, it's not to quote Liverpool, uh, but uh, <laughs> God is with us and He is journeying with us. And I just want to assure our people the church is also there with you. Yeah. I, th I think uh, Archbishop, I mean, uh, the church actually reacted quite fast when the MCO uh, was announced. We were one of the few um, to actually go live. So, I mean, I'd like to congratulate the team, Father Gerard, yourself and all for, for really reacting fast and, and to provide the service. So, I mean, to provide uh, yeah, masks for everyone uh, all around. I think that was something really amazing and something new for all of us. But I think it was something we adapted quite fast. And, and we see thousands of people actually watching the mass live and all, which was... Uh, pretty impressive yeah yes uh, i think we have our media team uh, yeah. which was also live streaming already the last couple of years yeah uh, little, little uh, feast days and uh, doing certain sessions with certain yeah. parishes and asayo and all. so we had uh, a, a little bit of uh, experience there and when we decided to go live to offer mass online uh, it was just a matter of uh, pressing the button and uh, yeah, we all were ready. And I'd like to mm -hmm. thank the team, the media team, uh, under Father uh, Peter Anthony and of course Ignatius Krishnan and, his, and the wonderful team that have worked so hard this last two, three weeks at least. Yeah, they certainly did a good job uh, in helping us throughout this Lenten and Easter period. Uh, Bishop, maybe right now we can just uh, take you back to your early years a little bit. Uh, have you always been close to the faith? Um, you know, did you like like the church stuff as a young boy? <laughs> I think when I was in my mother's womb already, I was in church. <laughs> I, was, I was an altar boy, uh, ah. and the five, and the six. So from from that moment already, we were, of course, going to church and then serving at Mass and then with the youth group, with the Christmas campaign, singing carols and going to the, the poor. Uh, yeah. This was one of the, I think, my early exposure to, to hardcore poor, uh, people living without roofs over their heads. Uh, and we used to joke, they live, hotels have only five stars. They have thousands of stars they can see. Mm -hmm. ah, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, uh, with the youth, and then uh, even while I was studying uh, in the university also, we were involved with the, with the Catholic youth groups. And uh, so, and then the work, Working, while working also, I was coming back to Swamban from KL to help out to teach catechism, post-confirmation post uh, students. Mm -hmm. So it's, and then the seminary, joining the seminary. Um, so, like what you said, probably overexposure to the church and now even more so as bishop. Yeah. 
when 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 do you realize it was your calling uh, archbishop i mean was there a moment when you were working or or when you were altar boy you always like had a calling like a like when i was an altar boy i know father simon always used to ask me and father philip when are you going to join the priesthood when are you coming for the vocation <laughs> yeah. camp i don't know whether were, were the parish priests influencing you that time in the same way actually no uh, perhaps my memory is poor i can't imagine or can't remember those days but uh, seriously thinking about the priesthood uh, i think was after form five while while waiting for results i guess you got a lot of time on your hands and that was the time also what i want to do with my life you know? so the normal things we fill in you know in your cumulative cards i don't know whether you have it in your face mm -hmm. what do you want to be when you grow up Priesthood was never on the list. <laughs> what what uh, was on the list? We want to know. <laughs> oh, interestingly, uh, I think you were all not born during that time. But uh, while I was growing up, we had all these shows about private investigators, yes. uh, uh, manics, and uh, can't remember now. But I think uh, one of the dreams was to be a PI, private investigator. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And then I used to travel in, uh, in, in, in buses, public transport with my grandmother. Uh, and I wanted to be a bus conductor. <laughs> was, you know, without holding anything, with just yeah. holding the tickets, he could balance himself on the speeding bus. And, uh, uh, I, I, just, I just want to ask you, did, did you save your bus tickets and then played bus tickets with your siblings? <laughs> <laughs> I probably did. Yeah. So these kinds of things that uh, that influenced uh, me in those those days in primary, secondary school. Of course, we wrote in in those cards what everybody writes, you know, to be an engineer, to be a teacher. Both my parents were teachers. So, mm, yeah, and uh, to be doctors, to be lawyers. So all these things were on the list, but. It was just put there because that was the right thing to do. Uh, but uh, finally, uh, I answered the call when I when I came back. Uh, although the call was there for about 12, 12 years since I left for, for, for overseas, uh, up to when I joined the seminary, it was a 12-year journey, so to speak. Uh, and finally, I couldn't run anymore away from from the lord so with the help of priests uh, religious uh, brothers and, and nuns i finally uh, made the decision to to try it out in the seminary and it's all history so to speak well when, when you when you made the decision uh, bishop how, how many hearts did you break did you have a girlfriend <laughs> yeah, I told you this interview is going to be a bit candid. Oh, you had girlfriends, uh, Bishop. You can you can cancel all this, lah, huh? because <laughs> <laughs> well, many friends who are girls, lah. Huh? <laughs> and uh, well, all 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 were part of my journey, I believe, uh, challenging challenging me, uh, uh, and also praying for me. So I would look at it as every person that has come into my life, uh, even today, is part of this journey of faith. Uh, yeah. and, uh, I was fortunate to have many of them during my, my youth days and during the times when I had to make decisions. Uh, they were put by God there to, to push me along, to prod me along, to help me to to make decisions yeah. was it a was it a tough decision to make i mean to to let go of everything or, or was it something uh, yeah. uh tough in the sense um of course leaving a job uh, telling your family telling your parents uh, and it's something i guess it's not normal uh, i remember I remember my boss uh, when I told him I was I was tendering my resignation. 
and uh, he couldn't understand. Mm. Are you going for something better, a higher paying job, uh, you know, more, more, more benefits? And when he heard there's no pay, <laughs> uh, he, he couldn't understand. But he respected my 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 choice, my decision. And I remember another another Haji, another friend of a colleague of mine. I remember his words. Sayang lah. Tak boleh kawal. Right in between the lines. Maybe it's Bobo. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, nevertheless, I guess it was uh, the beginning. Uh, and I went, of course, in faith. And uh, yeah. And if I were to live my life once again, this is before being the bishop, lah. I will live it again the same way. Now you ask me, I have to think about uh, being, being in this new role. Yeah. But Bishop, well, when you made the decision, I know I'm, I'm just wondering, it's such a big decision and uh, we all know that this um, affects, affects families a lot. And you said your parents were teachers. I suppose uh, in some ways they may have wanted you to become a teacher as, as well. How did you tell your parents? I mean, can, can you recall the moment or what was it, over dinner? Or did you subtly just uh, quote a scripture or something? And then, I mean, how, how do you tell your parents? First of all, both my parents uh, were teachers, as you said. Uh, and they, they never encouraged me to be a teacher. That's, that's one thing. <laughs> Uh, I guess not because the teaching profession is not, I think it's one of the most noble professions. But uh, perhaps they, they want, again, uh, when I, maybe going, maybe step back a little bit, when, when I even mentioned to them uh, about, actually, rewind a bit. Uh, <laughs> Going overseas, uh, going overseas yeah. also was another decision that uh, I hesitated to make because in the background, this call to the priesthood was, was, was there within me, but I never mentioned it to them. And when the opportunity came for me to go overseas to study, I hesitated for fear that I may lose this call to the priesthood. So I found all kinds of excuses why I shouldn't go overseas. You know, I I wanted to stay back and uh, pursue pursue this call. But uh, again, there were people who were uh, who influenced my decision also. And I remember one uh, one brother who mentioned that if you're not sure, God is calling you to the priesthood which I wasn't sure at that age, you know, 17, 18. Uh, don't miss the opportunity to further your studies overseas. And I remember these words, if God wants you, he will get you sooner or later. So it was 12, 13 years later, after the initial uh, from five, thinking what I want to do, uh, even from six, yeah, and uh, till I made the decision to go into the seminary. Thirteen long years, but uh, every one of those years were were discerning years for me. So, so it was it was uh, not easy uh, breaking the news to my, to my to my parents. And this was when I came back when I came back from overseas. And when I started working, I also bargained with God. Uh, while I was overseas, I was also, as, as I mentioned, uh, didn't want to go because of this call at the back of my mind. And while, while in the uni also, I was uh, going for vocation camps there. Mm -hmm. I went for a discernment camp because I wanted to be sure, I wanted to find out, is it a yes or a no? Uh, to the priesthood because I wanted to get on with life uh, to, to, to be sure. Mm -hmm. But after the discernment camp, I remember uh, 
the only answer I got was, you are a student now, finish your studies. Yeah? Don't worry, don't think about other things. Uh, do what you have to do, concentrate on your studies. And that was what I did. I could study in peace and could concentrate on my studies. And uh, I think that's... Uh, and then after my studies, I started to work. And then again, I asked God, is it time now? Or rather, he was asking me, are you ready now? And I said, no, let me work first. You know? After studies, let me work first. Let me work for two, three years to get some experience. What if I enter the priesthood and I leave halfway? I won't have any working experience, I, tell, I told myself. So always try to be, to, to, to have your bases covered. So I worked two, three years. And then it became four years, and and again, God asking me, okay, you, you, I've waited two, three years. What now? So I couldn't, I couldn't run anymore after thirteen years of study, of working, and I had to to make the choice. And and uh, I don't know whether I mentioned it before, but when I broke the news to my parents. Uh, mum was mum was saying if if you are happy I'll be happy for you yeah, if this is what you want to do for that it was a bit more difficult yeah. we had conversations before always about other people's sons becoming priests yeah. uh -huh. and you we are very supportive with other people's sons but <laughs> when it comes to your own it's a different story yeah. uh, so uh, I still remember when he, when I broke the news to him, when he had to sign my application form to the seminary. Yeah. Uh, I think he had a heart attack, uh, not not literally, but uh, <laughs> it was difficult for him uh, to, to 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 accept it, and uh, that was first year in the seminary. Uh, he didn't object. But uh, he wasn't he wasn't jumping for joy either. Mm -hmm. uh, but throughout the years, after a couple of years, when he saw me uh, serious about my, my, my priesthood or in the seminary, he he began to, to to warm up to it and began to accept accept the, the, my decision and. After a few years, he was one of my most ardent fans in the sense mm. Mm. He, would, he would advertise to strangers. Oh, my, my, my son is a priest. And uh, I remember when he goes for his, his checkups in the hospital, he will start the conversation with the nurses who are taking his, his, his blood pressure. Total strangers. Mm. And he will be bragging my son is a priest and i feel so embarrassed at times <laughs> and not even worse my son is the archbishop <laughs> wow you know um bishop we we're having this show because you know your sacerdotal anniversary is on the 20th of uh of april and you know of course you've made a lot of friends along the way as you became a parish priest i wonder if you would remember a special guest that we have on the show today you know as we continue to talk about your journey uh let's bring him on mark uh oh, <laughs> oh Alfred. hi hi bishop hi thank you mark and kevin for having me on the show hey, thank you anytime Thank you all for, for being on the show. Uh, you know, I, I know you've got a busy schedule today, but you know, it's good to have uh, one of Bishop's good friends on the show. And you know, I thought maybe you can just share a short story with us about uh, your friendship with Bishop. Be careful what you say. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> like me, not you. <laughs> so yeah, there, there are many, many. Um, so just now, like Kevin was saying, like 18 years, right? So I first met Bishop uh, 15 years ago, 2005, when he was the parish priest in Koli Family Kajang. Right, so 15 years uh, uh, we have known each other. Like what Bishop said, right? Time really flies. Um, 
there were so many stories, like there was a story about when we were having coffee in the coffee tiam and this uncle didn't recognize he was the bishop and started lecturing him on how important is BC. Right. <laughs> 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 right. There were there were so many stories on jogging, right? And, and yeah, so many interesting ones. But uh, one thing that stood out that I, I remember when I was a youth um, in 2005, right? So we always will meet up with Bishop uh, going out and have lunch and all. So there was one day Bishop says that to meet, meet him in front of KLCC, right? So there's this park. He says he's waiting in front of the park with a water fountain and all. So there were seven of us, right? There were seven of us uh, youths. So excited to go and see him, right? And all of us, were, there were a few Chinese, uh, Indian. Uh, one Indian guy looked a bit African. So we were, we were so excited. We reached the park, right? And we saw him sitting there and we ran towards him. And we ran towards him we were like, father, father, right? And some gave him a hug, father. And during that time, right? This when, when we were shouting father, father and hugging him, there was this few seconds of awkward silence. Because we noticed there's this Malay man sitting right beside Bishop and his jaw just dropped. He was shocked. Right? <laughs> Why these kids of uh, multi-race, you know, so hugging him <laughs> and calling him father. And uh, all of us just look at him and then he look at Bishop and he say, you know, uh, anak, semua anak, right? And I remember Bishop just say, I uh, know, padri and then started. But, <laughs> On a more serious, on a more serious note, uh, that story reminded me about how we are so excited to be in his presence, right? And what is interesting about Bishop, right, is he he practices the four L, right? That he always share the least, the last, the lost, and uh, what is it, uh, Bishop? Least, last, lost, little, 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 little. yes, little, <laughs> right? And throughout the years, uh, I always had the privilege of accompanying him and going out and meeting this four L, right? The least, the last, lost, and little. And of course, they are very happy. They are filled with joy. You know, Julian is coming. Bishop is coming to see me. They are, they are filled with joy. But what really amazed me is that every single time, right, Bishop himself is always full of joy, right? He himself is authentically so happy, so excited to go and see them. And very often that he will be so present, so mindful in the conversation with them that I have to, I'll be the one who have to remind him, hey, Bishop, Bishop, two o'clock, you got mass city, let's go, let's go. Yeah. And I think that's that's his biggest gift in his priesthood, right? The, the joy that when we go out and talk to four L's, the least, the last, the lost, and the little, right? do we do it just as a checklist? Do we do it as a chore because we have to? Or do we genuinely bring the joy in us when we meet them, right? So thank you so much, uh, Bishop, for inspiring all of us to be genuine, be joyful, and reaching out to the four L. Thank all you. Right. Awesome. How much they pay you? <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> is there anything you want to add to the story, Bishop? Uh, everything is true, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell you, la. <laughs> uh, we uh, right. save the secret story for another day. Uh -huh. All right, Alfred, before you go, uh, would you like to wish uh, Bishop anything else uh, since his um, anniversary is coming up? Yep, yep. So happy anniversary, Bishop. Uh, uh, like I said just now, thank you so much for inspiring uh, all of us. I think continue to do so. Wishing you great strength, great help, and continue to remind all of us the joy that we should bring and carry as we reach out to the 4L. All right. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you. you thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, see, you. So much. Thank, thank see you. See you, Alfred. Everybody. Yeah. So, Bishop, uh, that is true, actually. You know, I mean, everybody, I'm sure, remembers uh, your mission uh, statement when you were the bishop and you, you talked about the four L's. We all can remember the four L's, although sometimes we, we forget, oh, what are the four L's? You know, maybe it's time to add a fifth L for Liverpool. They are a bit lost and lonely and, you know. <laughs> no, but seriously, Bishop, uh, like you, you talked about your journey just now about serving the homeless and all that. There's something very close to your heart, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I guess it's because the exposure I had 
directly uh, with the Christmas campaign when I was in primary school. Uh, and then uh, even in the seminary, I remember when I went in, they were constructing the new hall. Uh, it was under construction, almost completing. And there were also migrant workers uh, uh, there. And while I was also in the construction industry in, in, in Singapore, in JB, in KL, I guess you know Malaysia, Malaysia has been built on the sweat and blood of foreign workers. Yeah. So I was exposed to Indonesians, to Thai workers in Singapore, and uh, now we are getting more and more Bangladeshis from India. And, and being in the church, uh, we, they are part and parcel of our our parishioners also in the, in the parishes. So we've got Vietnamese more and more now, Cambodians at one time. Uh, so all these, perhaps my past experience with them, perhaps preparing me for today uh, as, 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 as bishop, and not to forget the struggles that they go through, seeing how they live, especially on the construction sites and, and many of our uh, timber, they are working in all sorts of places, uh, rubbish, rubbish kickers, and, and the list goes on and on. Uh, my, my regret perhaps is maybe not doing enough, not doing enough for them. My, my hope is also uh, that we who are more fortunate are able to, to reach out for those who are less fortunate around us. And even in this in this lockdown, uh, stay home period, there's so much we can still do. You know? Like this, con con conversing on the phone and uh, through, through media. And perhaps it's interesting to note, letter writing somehow has gone out of fashion with, with the mobile phone and all. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps now, with those who especially do not have access to, to, to the internet, perhaps letter writing, because the post, the post is still still going on, I believe. Yeah, maybe. Even more, I understand. M many more parcels and, and med medication and things are being sent to the post now. Uh, and they are, they, are, they are overwhelmed. And maybe letter writing could be another way we can keep in touch, especially with those who are less tech savvy mm -hmm. the elderly and the lonely perhaps that is another way uh, we can keep in touch with uh, the lonely you know, another mm -hmm. l to add mm -hmm. this time. Uh, bishop you you talked about uh, your parents how they uh, slowly came to acceptance on your vocation uh, how about your siblings uh, tell us a bit more about how they reacted and uh, i believe uh, they have, you have uh, three other siblings yes that's right uh, they've always been very supportive uh, i'm very fortunate my two sisters and my younger brother uh, i've got an elder sister and a younger sister so four of us uh, they've been always it's very supportive uh, and I'm very fortunate and actually as we speak my, both my parents are in Singapore with my younger brother mm -hmm. uh, because of the uh, yeah my mom had a, a, a heart attack about a year ago uh, oh. she's fine now she she had a, one uh, stand put in and she's, she's doing well and for dad to be alone in Sramban when mom was was uh, re recover recovering uh, wasn't a good idea. So he went down to Singapore. Of course, he stayed a while with my sisters. And then uh, now my mom and dad have gone down to Singapore to mm. be with my brother there. Mm. Up to a week ago, I think Singapore was doing much better than Malaysia. But yeah. Uh, now right. we seem to be able <laughs> to overtake Malaysia with number of cases, but nevertheless, um, they are with him, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that they are together. 
to thank also my siblings uh, for for looking after mum and dad you know, all these all these 20 over years when I was away uh, overseas when I was away in the seminary and in the parishes so they two sisters and my brother have always looked after my parents and, mm-hmm. and continue to do so uh, I suppose Bishop you might have guessed by now that we have your parents on the line are you sure <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we we really we wanted to get them on the show, your siblings and your, your parents. But you know they have passed the torch to your niece. So Genevieve, are you with it? <laughs> well, this is a big surprise, right? I thank the Lord for the gift of His call. Since the day you answered, you've been in service of all. I'm inspired by you, dear uncle of mine. Love and care you package with the gift of your time. For each of us, you do your best to be there. There's simply no doubt that you so dearly care. Thank you for always going the extra mile. We enjoy your jokes and each silent smile. God handpicked you. Praise him for his choice. Blessed are you for tuning in to his voice. Though all you encounter as you walk his way, we support you, we love you, and for you, we pray. I thank you, Tuaku, for answering God's call. Your yes to our Lord is a blessing to all. That was a poem by your niece, Archbishop Genevieve. Thanks, Jen. Of course, uh, we've been talking a little bit about COVID-19 and, uh, and how this has affected um, families and uh, those who are maybe less fortunate. Uh, do you have any message for for all of us and what would you like to say to us uh, yes not to lose hope um, we are in this together we are in the same boat as Pope Francis has reminded us and we are not alone I just want to assure especially those who live alone those who have no one, no family, and at this juncture in their lives, they, they, they may be uh, facing many challenges, not able to go out to get food, or not having people around to, to interact with them, uh, not many friends. Um, just want them to know that the good Lord is with you, with us, and that God can come in many forms. God can come in different people, different circumstances. So to keep that light burning, to keep that flame alive, that flame of faith in your life, and uh, we will see this true together. God bless every one of you. Thank you, Archbishop. Archbishop, I just, uh, I mean, you spoke about, uh, sorry, just a bit more. Uh, you spoke about um, like your discernment and things like that. I mean, for maybe, could you share with us, like to, to those who are going, finishing their Form 5s or looking at what should they do in their life? Uh, I mean, what, I mean, we, you, we understand that you got your advice from the brother earlier and all who advised you. Uh, what advice would you give people who are discerning and going through the thoughts of, should I study or should I go and work first? Uh, yeah, so you'd like to hear some thoughts from your side. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, firstly, I think it's good to get a spiritual director, someone who can guide you to discern what the Holy Spirit is asking of you uh, in your life. And if you are just after Form 5, uh, don't join the seminary straight away. You're still young. Uh, pursue your, your studies and uh, listen. Listen to have a good prayer life, to listen to what God is saying you and as i mentioned god can speak to different people different circumstances and to be always open 
to the voice of God. And, and uh, yeah, continue to, to see opportunities where firstly, you must be a disciple of Jesus. You can't be a priest or a bishop without being a disciple first. So be a disciple of Jesus first and foremost. And, and then the Lord will reveal if he is calling you to, to different vocations. And married life is also a vocation. Being single is also a vocation. So have a, 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 a spiritual director to, to guide you. And my message to all our seminarians is to make use of this, this, this time, these eight years, uh, to really prepare to be a priest for, for the future. It's a priest for in, in eight years' time. And what kind of priest I should be when I come out uh, and to and this this COVID-19 is also a time for us to reflect uh, what kind of church uh, will we have in the next few years or the next few months. Uh, and I think this is something we need to discern together, laity, priests. And, and bishops. Uh, thank you, Bishop. And if you want thank to really know more, come and see. Come and see. So they, they need to contact the parish priest. Yeah. <laughs> to those who yeah. like to know more. Yeah. Yeah. So, so today, I mean, uh, how many uh, seminarians do we have uh, uh, in Peninsula? We have 25 uh, in, in, in the seminary. 25 seminarians from Sabah, Sarawak, and uh, Samumanjo. Uh, because the initiation year and the philosophy are in Penang. The theology is in Kuching. So Kuching also has about 20, 20 over theologians. And uh, Penang has uh, philosophers plus initiation year. 25 so about 50 50 plus for the whole of malaysia uh, sabah sarawak and Semenanjung. that's a good number to have right archbishop i mean is it well, growing uh it, it has always been more or less this numbers uh plus minus uh, but if you look at nine dioceses over eight years of of studies it's hardly one per year per semi per, per diocese. No? If it's yeah. if it's only fifty, yeah. So it's about yeah, it's about one or less than one per year per diocese, which is not great. If you look at it as as fifty, it, it is a good number, but uh, so we need more. We need more. Definitely. So I think uh, it's a shout out for. All those who are, I mean, they, I mean, they, they are, they are discerning and all. I think definitely speak to the parish priest. At the same time, also, I mean, um, for all those parents, also pray for the children. You know, what I mean, uh, that they find, if it's their calling to serve, I think it's an awesome calling. And uh, and yeah, I think all of us will pray together with you. Your own children, not somebody else's child. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> We're more than happy, actually. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, Archbishop Julian, now it's been a pleasure to have you on our show. On behalf of the Catholic community watching this, we wish you a very happy and blessed sacerdotal anniversary. We will certainly keep you in our prayers. Uh, but usually, before we end the show, uh, we usually end with a prayer. And I think uh, for all of us watching, we would uh, really be honored and love to have you uh, say a closing prayer to this session, if that's okay with you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Ben. Let us pray. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, dear Heavenly Father, we once again want to give praise and thanks to you for this time that we are able to share online for this recording and for my 18 years as 
a priest. I thank you, Lord, for this gift of vocation. And I thank you for the gift of family, the gift of priesthood, the gift of every person, the gift of life, and also the Archdiocese and beyond. And I ask you, Lord, to bless all our people, especially those who are struggling with this virus, all the healthcare professionals, and all those who are keeping our country moving and working, ask you, Lord, to bless each one of them too. And for the team, for all those who are making all our live masses and all our streaming possible, I ask you, Lord, to bless each one of them. And to my Archdiocese once again, to bless each one of you and to thank God for the gift of persons. And as I conclude this prayer, I ask Almighty God to bless each one of you. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much. Guys. Happy anniversary. Yes. Sacred Daughter <laughs> anniversary. Thank Congratulations, you. Archbishop. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder to the viewers, don't forget to watch our previous shows on Facebook, Catholics at Home, our podcast on YouTube and Spotify as well. I'm Kachan Kevin and on behalf of my co-host Mark Darren Lee, Alfred Neto, Genevieve Wong and of course uh, from the Most Reverend Archbishop Julian Liao, we wish you a blessed Easter as we continue to celebrate this great feast till Pentecost and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye everybody.